working on, on a novel. And the thing is, I've got I've got two beginnings and three endings, but I can't, but I don't have a middle. Middle's are hard. Uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll hard. Um, what is the what, is, what wisdom do you have to offer about middles? Well, Anatole used to say that you didn't that you should use the um, cinematic model that you didn't have to show the cowboy leaving the bar and riding on his horse for 10 miles to his ranch. He could say, so long guys, I'm going to my ranch, and the next scene he could be in his ranch. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the middle is just filler, and you don't need that filler. You can jump from one scene to another. Mm -hmm. You can have a collection of beginnings and endings. As well. oh, you know, I, this is different for different writers. I personally, start from the beginning, but I never know where the end is going to, is going to fall. Because when I tried it that way, I would, I would feel like I somehow have to take this story, I have, to, I have to sort of consider these characters as employees whose job it is to haul the story to its conclusion. And I never, I didn't have very good luck with that. So I would just sort of start and see where it went. Yeah. <coughs> I would do that too, but there's a danger in that. I mean, I know writers who outline everything. The late John Gardner used to put butcher paper around his studio and outline the entire novel and know exactly what was going to happen, subject to some change as mm -hmm. it goes along. I start with a sentence and try to keep going. And it, I feel like Sisyphus, mm -hmm. uh, but I try to keep going because I like to write the way I read. I like to find out what happens. And so it's an act of discovery. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. do the same thing. Yeah, but it's true that almost all of us work in some different way. Almost all of us suspect that we're doing it wrong. I do anyway. <laughs> I do. I had a better work habits. <coughs> um, yes. Yeah. Um, I was just noticing, you know, both um, selections are so beautiful and so different in some ways in terms of almost like um, inhabiting different worlds. And it just struck me that you're grounded in a way in, in um, a, a century which had much more grounding kind of stuff going on. And, um, and that feels like an enviable thing that somehow middle age in this day and age, you know, the mind is so much more crowded. Everything is refracted endlessly, right? There's a, there's, and even if you're not coming down off kind of speedy ecstasy, you know, which I'd love to see your guy do. I wonder what would I'd like that would look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. But um, just what the two of you, um, how you sort of experience in these two selections, hearing each other's, reading your own, what you think of some of the distance between the two of you in terms of sensibility and where your focus is and all of that. Well, uh, one of the reasons I read other writers all the time and one of the reasons I'm especially interested in contemporary writers is that I'm aware of the fact that we are all bringing to our work a different time, a different body of experience, a different sensibility, which is all part of the giant book that we're writing together. That if you could actually take all these books and all the rest of the books and squeeze them into one book, you would still not have the book. But you know that we are we are in our way, each of us collaborating on the gigantic, impossible story of all creation. And so each of us is contributing the piece we're given, you know. And we're stuck with our own sensibility. We're yeah. stuck with who we are. We're stuck with our childhood. Yeah. Flannery O'Connor said all the writer needed was a childhood. <laughs> and that's yeah. true. We're stuck with how we were taught, the language we heard at home. Um, whether our parents were educated or not educated, what kind of education we went on to have, who we read. I mean, a writer has only a certain amount of material to work with. 
Some comes from experience, some comes from imagination, some comes from dreams, and some comes from reading other writers, not necessarily as a plagiarist, but as someone who absorbs, more like a cannibal, who you know, <laughs> eats other writers in right, order to right, exist. Right. 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 And you know, both are intensely relevant. In other words, there's something about the interplay between them that is um, sort of just wonderful in and of itself, <laughs> you know. That, that just the conversation between the two, what you each read, it's just, yeah. That's it's interesting book, because right. we didn't get together and talk about what we got to read at all. No, no. Pure chance. Right, yeah. yeah. What is most important to either of you, the plot, the character, the atmosphere? Uh, mm. what, could you repeat that question? Uh, what is most important, the plot, the character, the atmosphere? For me, character <coughs> is everything. Voice, character, that I think if you know your characters, they tell you the story. Uh, I would never uh, minimize how important the plot is, though. Everybody wants to hear a story. You can't just have the voiceover of a character in your head going on endlessly. But the first thing is character. I agree, I agree. And I, I'm actually, uh, I, I teach, <laughs> and I will, I will be doing this exercise in my class tomorrow. There's a lot. One of the most frequently heard questions from students is, I don't know how to write a plot. Um, and the, here's the exercise we're, we're doing tomorrow that I do every year. We collaborate together as a class, there's 12 students and me, on a character. I'm writing on the board and we start from the most basic of questions. Man or woman, race, age, Sexual, you know, it, it, and, and then we get more and more, more and more detailed occupation, love status, friend, you know, more and more specific uh, outfit, childhood, um, and then we get to two very important questions, which are, what does this person want more than anything in the world? Three, what's get, what's interfering with that? With the understanding that they, 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 yeah, didn't that be grand? I mean, they might both just wanted to go to better parties. <laughs> but something that the character ardently wants, something that's standing in the way, and what is the secret this person is most eager for you not to know? <laughs> and every single time you get a story, it never fails. And it's coherent. It's coherent and, and interesting and going someplace, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good exercise. I wish I had known it when people were my students. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't need it. Um, Mr. Cunningham, I, there are two, no words to describe all the levels and dynamics and beautiful components of your novels. Um, but for me, what stands out consistently throughout the course of them is sort of the haunting loneliness I get from several different characters in your novel. but. How, amazing, how amazingly they persevere through all of their circumstances. And um, it's more of a comment as opposed to a question, but it's just, it's absolutely riveting. Um, and um, I just want to thank you. That's basically it. Um, it just, you know, that's all. So thank you. Thank you. I have to say that Michael and I knew each other in another incarnation. For a little while, we were part of a small writing group. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. For a very short time. The reason most of us dropped out is Michael was writing the hours and reading chapters to us <laughs> every week. If anything could be yeah. discouraging, <laughs> if anything could feel competitive, all the things I didn't want to have in a workshop, and there were only four or five of us. I was in one of my terminal blocks anyway, but I had the joy of listening to those sentences and those chapters. I mean, extraordinary. You're right. So what is your relationship with Virginia Woolf? What is my relationship to Virginia Woolf? You know, I um, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, she didn't live there, did she? Briefly, <laughs> 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 they, they cut out of the diaries. Um, for, you know, um, and I was not a especially bookish child in a perfectly lovely family without books. We didn't really have books, really. Um, and I had a crush on a girl who, um, one of those girls, you know, she was 
older than I was. She was senior. 58. Was no. <laughs> and, you know, beautiful and tough and mean and smart. Everybody was terrified of her. And some older guy picked her up and, in, a, you know, in a Mustang every day. Like, that girl. You know that girl. And I um, was talking to her and blabbering on. And she sort of made some comment about how really stupid she thought I was, um, <laughs> which even I could not construe as flirtation. Um, but she sort of got, was sort of smoking grandly and going on about how she was reading outside the curriculum, of course, um, Wolf and T.S. Eliot. I went to the library. And they didn't have any Eliot. They only had one book by Virginia Woolf, Is it Dalloway? It took that. And I could, you know, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't tell what was going on. But it was the first time I'd seen sentences like that. I hadn't known you could use ink and paper to produce sentences of such balance and grace and density and variety. And I remember thinking, oh, she was doing with language. So it's something like what Jimi Hendrix does with a guitar. <laughs> and it it was revelatory to me, and it made it made me begin to read, and ultimately begin to write. So, well, I know this is a bit of a stretch when you picture Virginia, but, but she was like my first kiss. She was like my first love. She was the one who opened a certain door. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, so Virginia. Yeah. Yes, over there. Oh. oh. Since we're talking about the hours, I thought it was really interesting that all of the characters in our female and their stories, especially Laura, really resonated with me. So I just was wondering how you kind of go about making sure that your characters sound authentic, especially with that one from a man's perspective. Yeah, thank you. Oh, the, the, the question is about, about being a man trying to write women characters. Um, I don't find it tremendously difficult. I don't know why that is. Um, it may just be that I like women more than a lot of men writers do. I don't know. But um, it doesn't feel like a huge jump. But I do have the good sense. When I finished with the draft, I certainly did this with the hours to show it to some biological women <laughs> <laughs> who had some, some really good ideas. Um, my friend Marie, for instance, just this one thing said, well, I think Clarissa would be more conscious of social inequity as she walks through New York, and she wouldn't be so tough on her friend Richard. Um, but you know, what you're really getting, I think, when you do that is, how to put this, a slightly more informed, but inevitably subjective reaction. Um, I am a white, gay, American man. Am I an expert on white, gay, American men? No. There's all kinds of variations about which I would, you know, I, I can sort of, I can sort of ballpark it for you. But you know what I mean. It, it's a tricky thing. On one hand, you want to double check with somebody whose experience is actually is. Yes. On the other hand, you understand that there's no expert on women this. Or manness, or anyness. So you have, so you, you gamble and you hope. Um, uh, Paula, you know and of course, Hilma was reading a male character mm -hmm. who was completely convincing to me, um, and s with great sympathy. Uh, <coughs> and a man of age, which is also not that common, and um, <coughs> made it very interesting, the predicament of a man of that age. So I wonder how you would answer the question about writing from inside somebody of another gender and other kinds of differences. From well, I think there is an otherness to almost all of your characters. And there's a particular otherness to a male character for a female writer. For me, there was. And um, it was easier to do an older man. I did a children's book from the point of view of a 13-year-old boy, and I sold it 
immediately. I was at I was at Yaddo and I had done a draft and sent it to my editor and he bought it. But he said, I'd like you to do a rewrite because she's, he sounds like a 50-year-old woman. <laughs> and I had to do an entire rewrite. I, had to, I went into the schools in Saratoga and spoke to some 13-year-old boys and realized that no, a kid who's running away from home would not say on the eve of my departure. No. <laughs> and it, was, it was a question of language. But I also felt I knew this guy, I knew what he was going through, and I wasn't too conscious of trying to make it sound like he had a penis. Mm -hmm. It just didn't seem to me the most most it's important involved. thing was is that he had a heart, and he had a brain, and and he was suffering, and then he was joyful, and and I felt that those were uni uh, those were universal experiences, and that he was lonely, and that too was not a gender specific mm -hmm. condition. So I felt that was easy enough to do. I've, I've always marveled at how uh, organically, really without any thought or decision process, those of us who write, some of us go into fiction, some into nonfiction, some into playwriting, some into children's work, some into poetry. And it's always seemed to me that there must be characterological baggage you bring into that without really um, having much choice about it. It's the character that takes you in the direction you ultimately go in as a writer. I wonder what, what you need to add to that. I want to make sure I understand. <coughs> I, th I think probably not every, never, I'm not sure if everyone could hear it. Uh, uh, Question, question of some of us go into fiction, poetry, playwriting. Um, do, you want to, uh, do you want to talk about sort of drifting toward a form? Like you said, you also mentioned following a character. Um, which, why, one, which one do you want to talk about? Why, why do you think that those who write follow the paths right, right, right. Do, which are so distinct from right. each other? Why do we do what we do? Yeah, yeah why do you do I what think we do? some of it has to do with what you like to read. Um, as a kid, I wrote, like most kids, really terrible poetry, really bad stuff. And um, I liked to read poetry, but then I realized how much more I liked reading stories. Uh, I still read poetry because I enjoy it and because it teaches me to be economical and to be musical in fiction. But I'm drawn to character in stories. I want to find out what happens to everyone. The greatest compliment a writer can receive, uh, I used to write children's books. I did those in between. And I got a letter from a child who asked, someone was pregnant, a, a mother is pregnant at the end of the children's novel, and a kid wrote, what did she have, a girl or a boy? <laughs> and to project a character into the future is something you want to do as a writer. And if the reader does it, it's heaven. To imagine what the future of that character is like. Uh, and people who have more interesting lives in mind, I think, would write memoirs. Mm. If I had known I was going to be a writer, I would have lived differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not fiction is out. I have trouble with facts. Um, I, I love plays. I mean, I, I actually am starting to do screenplays, and I like it every bit as much as I like fiction. Uh, I think there's a sort of temperamental and slightly mysterious quality to the choices, even the unconscious choices you make. I, I also tried writing poetry as an adult, and it really, it sucked, it was terrible. And um, I, I began to realize that, how to put this, poetry is language that just sort of twirls its own language dire, as opposed to my sense of fiction, which is, which is I was trying to get language to twirl in a sort of glittering and interesting way around the rather stodgy core of a story. You're actually throwing sparks against something made of brown ceramic, and I like that. You know what I mean? Uh, the, just, the pure conjuring of, of, a, of, a, of a language cloud. Uh, it loses me. It loses me. But, but, but essentially, I came with dogs. Sentences, sentences aimed at something inert I love. 
And also there's the choice between writing short stories and novels within fiction as well. And I started out as a short story writer and published several short stories. And some editor wrote and said, do you have a novel? So I wrote one because I was a good girl. And I never was able to write a story again. because. And it wasn't that my novels were longer, they were wider. They were broader, they were more encompassing. Uh, if a character walked into a room, I had to know about that character. I had to follow the character out of the room and find out what he or she was doing or thinking. And I really miss the short story. And I think of Alice Munro and her wonderful short stories that take place over life a lifetime. And then you have Mrs. Dalloway, a novel that takes place in one day. So there are no rules for it but you're, dr you're drawn towards something. I, I would give anything now to write a good short story. In fact, that's what I'm going to do when I come. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> one more, and then we should say goodnight? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, I just need to set the question, but I mean, aside from the fact that you're both passionate about writing and very, very successful, and that you are professional writers, is there something now, because you have been so successful and, and, and done that, that you look for something else in your work uh, in other words, in other words, there's something you like, uh, like a different kind of legacy, or, or trying to get a different reaction than when you were starting out, or when you were, you know, struggling for that financial and, and literary success. Is there something? What, what's the, does something else drive you now in addition to what may have driven you earlier? Well, I sort of think all art is against death, so that's driving <laughs> me all the time. Um, if I keep writing, you know, I'll keep living in a way. Um, I want to get better. As old as I am, I really just want to get better. And I don't even know what it means exactly. Grace Paley used to say to her students, don't make the story better, make it truer. And I think I want to find more inherent truths. And it's not the truth that um, if you get on this bridge, you go from one place to another. Those, those are important. The facts, those are facts. But the kind of truth of how we live, and I want to find out newer ways of explaining how we live. Or demonstrating, I shouldn't say explaining, that's the worst thing. Demonstrating how we live. How about you, Mark? I feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I mean, I, I, could, I, could, I could rephrase it. Um, not as well, but yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it's a, a very surprising sort of recognition is a wonderful thing, but and it, I don't, I wouldn't want to say it doesn't make any difference, but it doesn't make the difference that I might once have thought it would. Because really, really, what a body of work is to me is the evidence of what a writer spent over a lifetime of learning how to write novels by writing them. And you die still learning how to write a novel. I, once, I went to high school with Maurice Sendak, and I spoke to him. I sat next to him in major art. He did my margins, which I could never do on a drawing. And I met him years later when he was famous. We had the same editor, and I said, so how does it feel? And he said, I still have to die. Because he's kind of a melancholy, very funny, but melancholy guy. He dies anyway. What's that? I just said he dies anyway. 